Barone. Again, my name is Jim Legacy. I work for the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, as you can see the masthead right above me. And I've been coordinating a program called the Angler Education Program for a long time now. Um, and with that, um, we get the same kind of themes over and over, the same questions about how to fish. And, and, and we've kind of, I've kind of compiled that into a learn to fish tutorial here for you tonight. Um, Mass Wildlife wants people to care about the outdoors. So the, the larger goal of the Angler Education Program is that, is to get people interested in the outdoors through the experience of fishing. Fishing is not just what we do. We're an environmental or an outdoor education program. And we really want people to care about the outdoors. And you're not going to care about the outdoors unless you learn um, to experience it and find a passion in it. And I think fishing is one of the easiest ways uh, to learn that. It's not for everyone. We want people to care about it, whether you're a bird watcher, hiker, hunter, um, camper, any any outdoor passion that you have that, that gets you to the outdoors is wonderful. So we're going to focus on fishing tonight, and that's how we're going to do it. And I am going to pull up a PowerPoint presentation. And I know, I know we're all kind of PowerPointed out, but I promise you it should be somewhat entertaining. Um, I've even interjected a video and, and we will, I might even pause it a little bit to show you some resources we have on our website that'll help you in your fishing journey. So I'm gonna call this Let's Go Fishing with the Mass Wildlife Angler Education Program. And again, we've, I've kind of compiled this from the frequently asked questions that I've gotten over the years in running this program. And the program is a statewide program we do in a normal year um, we do over 100 um, Learn to Fish programs from um, weekend freshwater fishing festivals to uh, weekday clinics to adult fishing programs, to fly tying programs in the winter and ice fishing programs in the winter. Um, we make available rod and reels to loan for groups. So if you're a group out there and you want to borrow some equipment to run a program, whether it's a, just a learn to fish program or a derby, we're all about that too. So we're all about fishing and getting folks outside, not just for kids. It's not just a kids program. It's a family and adult program as well. In fact, the research shows that if you focus on families, you will make anglers a lot more than just focusing on the kiddos because the parents have to be involved. So with that, why don't we get started? if my um, cursor will move it forward here for me. There we go. So we're gonna call this the top 10 fishing tips created from all of our questions over the years. And this should help you get started if you're a newbie. So the first thing is you're always gonna to have to know the rules. If you start playing baseball, um, badminton, <laughs> what have you, what pastime you take up, you, got, you have to know the rules and fishing is no different. There's some rules, there's not a lot. There's a handful and we're going to walk through those um, and that and that's that wraps into conservation stewardship fish identification fishing rules and regulations and fishing licenses conservation and stewardship is really important conservation is learning how to care about the outdoors and and stewardship is well conservation is learning how to conserve what we have and stewardship is learning how to care about it so caring and conserving our natural resources is hugely important whether you realize it or not so it's there in the future and not just locked away at a zoo or at a national park. It's there for everyone to use on our, in our public lands throughout the country. So if you care about the resource, it'll be here. And if you learn to partake in the resource, whether it's fishing or some other outdoor pastime, you will learn to care about it, hopefully, so it's there going forward. So that's the most important thing um, in terms of fishing is just learning about the resource and caring for it. So. Do I need a, here's my first question I always get, do I need a fishing, do I need a license to go fishing and where can I buy it? Well, the, the, the answer is of course, yes. The Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife operates with a dedicated funding stream on the backs of people that fish and hunt. So with that money, we manage all fish and wildlife throughout the state, plants and animals. Um, and most of what we do is, you know, not just the, species that you would fish or hunt for, it's all those endangered species too, and species of special concern and threatened species and the habitats they live on. So that license, your license dollar goes to all those critical needs. Um, and being a um, private funding, um, state age, privately funded state agency, that's so critical for us um, um, to be able to maintain these resources. So to walk you through it, if you're 14 and under, you don't need a license. You still need to abide by the few regulations I'm going to show you in a minute. If you're 15 to 17, 15 and up, you need a license. And 15 to 17, currently it's free. You still need to have it. You'd go to our website and essentially print it off. There's a little 
convenience fee of a dollar or something to do that, but you or you can come to one of our offices or vendors and, and get it for free. If you're 18 to 64, the current cost is 27.50, and these are annual, 65 to 69 is discounted, 70 plus, it's free again, you still have to have it, but it's free. Non-residents are 37.50, that's fresh water. Now, if you're fishing in salt water, and a lot of people, especially here in Massachusetts, we have thousands or well, like hundreds of miles of coastline here, um, and it may be more than that if you if you pencil it all out and go through all the inlets and and, and coves and all those areas along the coast. Um, you need a, a saltwater license too. It's called a permit. It's ten dollars if you're 16 and above, unless you're if you're under 16 or over 60. Um, under 16, you don't need to have one. Over 60, you do, but it's free. But if you're going in someone's boat that's that you're paying for, um, the captain usually those. Um, charter boats, the captain would carry it for you. You don't need to have the license. But if you're just going down to the ocean and throwing your uh, bait out into the water, you need to have that license if you're within that demographic. All these are based on a calendar year. So if you're purchasing now, it's good till the end of December. And the best way to buy it is right on our website. And I can show you that in a little bit. Do I need a license to take my child or grandchild fishing? We get this question all the time and we always have for years. And it's a wonderful question. I would just say it's best to have it, again, because you're contributing to that wonderful um, conservation of Massachusetts and our dedicated funding stream. You do need to have it if you're, so, so here's the law, you do need to have it if you're casting the line or reeling it in. So if you're in control of the rod and reel for that child or grandchild or friend, um, you do need to have it, but you don't need to have it to help them. So if you're just putting their bait on, untangling the line, removing their fish, you know, kind of helping them cast, but if you grab the rod out of their hand and cast it for them or take it out of their hand and reel it in for them, then, you, then you're actually physically fishing and you would need the license. So it's always good to have just in case because fishing is a blast and it's a very small fee really if you compare it to like a night out, go to the dinner and a movie, $27.50 for the year is, is pretty, um, pretty cheap if you get out and use it just a few times. So there are a few r rules and regulations with fishing. They're, they're called... Um, size and catch limits and daily creel limits. That's how many you can keep. So there are certain species that do, certain species that don't. Here in Massachusetts, we're pretty much, um, it's, it's fairly easy to, to, to understand our regulations. We are, um, we don't overregulate. We're not regulating really by region or water body by water body. There are a few separate water bodies that have different regulations, but by and large, most wa public water bodies are gonna be, you know, fishable, you know, 365, 24 seven, as they say, and you, these regs will apply for all of them. Certain states, like if you go to Maine in particular, in, in New England, they, they manage the resources down to the water, water body by water body or by region in certain situations. So you really need to have that fishing guide and know where you're fishing um, and, and, and be responsible. But Massachusetts, it's a little easier in terms of the regulations. So let's take a look. So species that have limits imposed on them and the current regulations are right underneath them. So you have your, your popular largemouth bass and smallmouth bass. So if you wanted to keep those fish, you can keep five a day and they have to be at least 12 inches. And we'll get into why you would keep fish in a bit. Um, then there's the walleye, which are very large, good eating fish that are restricted to mostly Merrimack uh, and Connecticut rivers and a little bit of their tributaries. You have the big, long, um, toothy critters called the pike and the um, chain pickerel. And those, those, are, um, those are very popular fish and those regulations are right there too. And then the trout, the trout and the salmon are, are regulated. We, we keep and, and maintain a modern um, fish hatchery, um, five of them actually throughout the state. And we stock about a half a million trout in the spring and another 50 or 60,000 in the fall. Um, and a lot of it's a put and take fishery. So you, we put it out there and you hopefully go out and enjoy it. It's an excuse to get out and fish and to eat those fish. And again, we'll talk about um, eating the fish later. Some people do, some people don't. And then there's species that don't really have limits imposed. And the reasons being is they're a little bit lower on the food chain. They're a little bit, they're in most cases, a lot more prolific. So there's not the real need um, to, to regulate them down to how many you can keep a day and minimum sizes. So currently, there's none on the species listed on the screen. It doesn't mean in the future um, that won't happen. So you, when you, when you um, begin your fishing journey, you should always keep a, uh, an annual copy of our fishing regulations. 
Um, and you can get that right online, print out the fishing section, or if you go to one of our vendors, like a, a, one of the sporting goods stores throughout the state or come to our office, it's a booklet you can have that talks that shows you the fishing regulations. But currently there's nothing on the smaller sunfish, like the pumpkin seeds, the bluegills, the calico bass, the perches, um, the catfish, and catfish can get pretty big. So don't just think it's little fish. Sometimes even the big fish can be pretty prolific in certain water bodies. And of course, American eels. So right now there's there's no regulations on these. So these are some of the species that people would take home and eat and would think as game fish species. And the other ones are very popular as game fish species. And they're typically a little larger and less prolific. So they need a little bit more protection. So can you catch a wild fish and bring it home and put it in your fish tank or private pond. Um, this is an often asked question and, and we get all the time, even through emails. Um, and that's how fish got moved around better than a hundred years ago. And our state agency was guilty of it, moving fish um, from water body to water body and, and nationally moving it from state to state. That's how, that's how fish did get moved around, but it's very illegal now. Um, there's a lot of good reasons why you shouldn't do that. Um, so it's a black and white, regulation. The only two legal reasons to keep a, fi a wild fish or a fish that you'd catch out of a, uh, a natural water body is to eat and or have it preserved by a taxidermist, which is a fish artist. Um, <clears throat> and they would they would take that, that, that fish that you bring to them and they would make it look alive so you could bring it home and put it on your wall. And some people really like to do that. Some people like to um, have artifacts on their walls, uh, fish and wildlife artifacts. So that's an option, but those are the only two reasons you can keep a legal sized fish and bring it home. Um, otherwise, that and, and what those two things have in common is those fish have to be um, euthanized or dead when they leave the water. You can't take them alive home um, or to the taxidermist um, or to bring them home in a bucket alive before you eat them. They have to be dead before you move them off the water. That's the letter of the law. So many people don't realize that though. Um, so why these laws are in place now? Well, all you have to do is look at, at really big examples of like grass carp in the Mississippi drainage or the round goby in the Lake Ontario drainage or recently like the northern snakehead down the Potomac River. These are illegal introductions that have, well, some are illegal. Some were, were just kind of, they, they escaped, um, you know, I think in, in terms of the grass carp, biologists actually brought them in well over 100 years ago to control one problem down in the, the southern part of the Mississippi drainage. And they escaped, of course, and now they're throughout the drainage and causing all kinds of concerns. But some of them were actually illegal introductions like the northern snakehead in the Potomac River by um, by folks that kept them for aquaculture reasons. They kept them for food fish. They you know, or as pets or what have you, and then they release them illegally into the water. And you don't want to do that because there's no natural predators where they're being released here, where they're originally from. Some were from Asia, um, and particularly the Asian carp and the northern snakehead. Um, they were from Asia. They were within their niche in Asia. They had their food chains worked out over hundreds of thousands of years. So they are naturalized. You come here, there's no natural predators, um, and they can really um, kind of grow exponentially unchecked. So if you want reasons why these laws now are black and white, why you can't move live fish from one water body to the next, check out a couple of those big demonstrative examples and, and you'll, it, it'll open your eyes as to why we don't allow this anymore. And no states do, and, and the federal government doesn't either. So um, if, if people are doing it by moving them from one water body to the other water body with their bucket to say, oh, this water body should have more fish or this species of fish, it's very much illegal. So please let, let folks know that and don't do it yourself. So. Larger tip number two is to pick a great location to go fishing. And that's not hard to do here in Massachusetts or New England. There are so many wonderful water bodies. The glacier, glaciers that receded 10 to 12,000 years ago left us with tremendous uh, water bodies and tremendous um, depth and breadth of water bodies. So we have rivers and lakes and uh, ponds and you know all kinds of different um, habitats within those tiny streams, larger streams, major rivers. Um, so we didn't happen to have a tremendous fishery after the glaciers receded. And that's why 100, 150 years ago, um, state agencies, especially in the Northeast did start moving around fish. Um, and that's a larger story. We don't allow it anymore, but that's why we have so many uh, diverse species here in Massachusetts now and throughout New England. Um, so pick a great location, pick one close to home. 
and that's not hard. Um, so where are you allowed to fish? Well, there's again, hundreds of fishable water bodies here in Mass, and many of them are overlooked. These tiny little ponds that you drive by on the way to work or school, uh, you know, or you walk by and you think, oh my God, there can't be anything in it. Look at that little tiny thing. You would be so surprised the fish that are in some of those little ponds. Take example of this little pond right here in Springfield. This is called Barney Pond in Forest Park. And we, we, we do events here occasionally when they allow us. Um, and there is some tremendous, even big bass, pumpkin seed bluegills in that pond. And you wouldn't think so. You'd walk by it and go, oh my goodness, look at a weed choked little pond in the summer. But it's, it's a great little fishery actually. So there's a lot of water bodies like that from smaller ponds like the one you see here to big large reservoirs, which are man-made um, water bodies, typically for drinking water supplies, which can be tremendous fisheries here. Just make sure that they are open to you. Don't assume because there are some of the aforementioned um, um, water um, bodies that were created for drinking water supplies that might be closed or might be closed seasonally that you don't want to make the mistake of fishing without knowing that. But most of them, and I'll show you a resource in a moment that is going to be good for you if you want to find places near where you can fish. So if you go to our website, you're going to get a link after this. I typically get um, the emails from and hopefully the Framingham Public Library will let me, and I'll send you the link to all of our fishing resources. And it was gonna be just a little two minute walk through to show you, we have what we call a Go Fish Mass map. And it looks similar to this, only now this is dated. So now there's a, a bazillion more stars here. And these are all the water bodies around the state that are fishable. And it tells you what's in those water bodies, access to those water bodies, gives you directions to those water bodies, so if you're living in the Boston area and you want to know where to go fishing, like you're going to take a trip on the Cape or the Berkshires, you can just go to this website and go to our website and find that or find local water bodies right around you. I always recommend that you fish close to home. If you're new, have a couple of water bodies that you can get to quickly to gain confidence in fishing. You don't have to travel too far. Some states like out West, you've got to go hundred miles to get to a good fishable uh, pond, lake or river. So here we're so lucky you can drive two minutes pretty much in any direction and get to a place that fishes, that's fishable. And of course in New England, you have this giant pond just to our East called the Atlantic Ocean. And this can be a wonderful fishery. Don't overlook this. Don't be intimidated by it. It doesn't take too much knowledge. It's a little more difficult than freshwater fishing, but saltwater fishing can be so rewarding, especially this time of year from like mid to late May through early uh, fall. It can be loaded with um, striped bass and bluefish and scup and flounder and all and, and, and all those good species that are really close to shore and, and, and a blast of fish and they can get, be really big. So don't overlook that. And our sister agency, the Division of Marine Fisheries, has a lot of resources on how to fish the saltwater. I would just give you a hint, it's tide dependent. You want a moving tide, so you want an incoming or an outgoing tide. Um, don't fish a slack tide, a low tide, or a, or a stagnant high tide. The, 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 the tides move the bait fish around and the bigger fish follow the bait fish. So you want, you want the tide to be right. And then you just wanna upsize your gear. I'm going to show you some gear um, tips in a few minutes, and we just want to upsize it for saltwater. It's just bigger. Um, so amazing amount of resources we have in Massachusetts for fishing. So finding fish, once you've gone to our website, picked a pond by you or located a pond near you, you have to know where to find them within the water body, and you really want to just look for structure. Just there, there's a saying in real estate, what sells is location, location, location. Well, what, where do you find fish? Well, that's structure, structure, structure. Again, that's location within the water body. So you'll see this nice calico bass, which is a beautiful smaller member of the largemouth bass family. We, I caught him last year out of the lily pads here. Again, structure, something that gives them a place to hide, a home, if you will. Largemouth bass love it in the weeds. They love these big um, tree roots that grow down into the water. They love boulders. They love deep water habitats. So look for that. Don't just walk up to the shore and in the sandy beach area and start casting because that's probably not going to be as productive as that big old down tree you see or all that aquatic vegetation or boulders in the water. And like this nice brook trout hiding under one of those undercut banks in the rocks along the stream. So look for structure, look for hiding places and, and you'll find a lot more fish. Oh, and <clears throat> yeah, so that, those are the places right there I just highlighted on the bottom. So getting the right equipment is important, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, a simple, when you're just starting, a simple hook bobber and rig is 
all you really need like this little fella has. You see he has a little rod and reel with a bobber and the fish is on the hook right here, a bluegill. Very simple, very inexpensive, and it allows you to learn to, to catch fish, to, to gauge the tug on the line, to set the hook, to bring the fish in. No matter how simple it seems, you need to get through that method to gain confidence to start targeting bigger fish or other gear or different methods. It's just like when, when you learn to drive a car, you need to learn all the basics before you can really um, hone down to the, the type of car you want and what you want it for. So same with fishing. If you don't really know how to fish or what to fish for, just get a, a bait combo, learn to rig it, get it in the water and, and, and get your chops right away by catching some fish. And then, uh, and then you can start to hone your, your trade. So the basics is just a push button spin casting rod and reel, very light, short. If they're little fellas, little folks like you guys, or like you two there looking at me outdoors, though this is kind of the right combination for them. If they get about seven, eight, nine years old, that same rod and reel, but a longer rod. You don't need a really short rod unless you're really young like this. So that is the most important part, getting the right rod and reel. And the best rod and reels for beginners are the two that are checked off on the top of the page here. So that would be the spin cast or push button rod and reel, the spinning rod and reel to the right. Those are the two. The ones you want to avoid if you're a beginner, and please heed this, would be the bait casting rod and reel and the fly rod and reel. They're both wonderful tools to have in the arsenal, <clears throat> but you definitely don't want to start with them because – um, you might start your journey and then realize right away how frustrating it is and quit before you even get started. And I'll, I'll tell a little story about that as we're going here. So you want to get the right rod and reel, and, then you want, and we're going to talk more about rod and reels in a bit. And then you want the terminal tackle. And, and the right rod and reel can easily be bought um, where you can get it right from the comfort of your home, right, on Amazon. I'll show you the right ones. And, and if we back up, you can kind of get a peek at them here, the push buttons, this is what they look like. They, they're a variety. Some of them don't have this little tiny back handle. Some of them long handles off the back end like this, but they all have the little black button on the back and they all sit on top of the reel and or a spinning rod and reel that sits under that has this post and you can see the line. Very distinct combinations um, to get. But again, Amazon, if you get it online um, or obviously the big blue stores, Walmart, Dick's Sporting Goods, Lots of small little bait and tackle shops still exist throughout the state. I would recommend going to them because not only can you get the rod and reel there, you can get tips on how to use it and, and, and they'll even put the line on for you if it doesn't come loaded with line. And so, so, and they don't cost much. I mean, these, these combinations are 20, $25. So you're not breaking the bank. And the, the littler ones, the ones that I showed you a picture of before with the little boy are 10 to $15. So again, don't spend a lot of money when you're just starting. These can be quite a bit more money. The ones down here, the bait casting and the fly rod, can, those can be upwards of $500 to $1,000 for good ones. So what, you need something that goes on the end of that rod and reel, and that's called terminal. Or, ter, terminal just mean the end, the end of the rod and reel. So that's terminal tackle. And if you're just live bait fishing, you need a hook, obviously, to catch the fish. And the hook has a little bit of an anatomy, and you should know it um, to be safe, obviously. Um, the eye is where the – this part, gosh, the cursor's not cooperate. So the eye of the hook is here, and that's where you put the line through. And then you have the shank, the bend, the gap. But the, the other two most important parts are the point, the two points, the point, and then the barb. The barb – um, a lot of people overlook, and then if the point goes under their skin, they realize that there was another point that's going to hold it there. So we always recommend using hook that, hooks that look more like this. This is called the circle hook. It has the point, but we take that second barb or second point off. For safety, you still catch a lot of fish, but if, the, if it accidentally goes in, under your skin and your arm, your hand or anything, which is rare, if you're paying attention, that doesn't happen. But sometimes a swinging hook will just go under your skin a little bit. It'll come right out. But if it has this barb here, that's meant to hold it in the fish's mouth, but consequently it'll also hold it under your skin too. So we recommend if you're a newbie, just take a pair of pliers and clip that barb off or a little nail file and just file it flat. You'll still catch a ton of fish. Keep a tight line. The, the, the hook will come right out of the fish's mouth, if you, if, especially if you're catching and releasing the fish. And if the worst happens, you accidentally swing it and get it under your skin or your arm or your hand or something, it'll also come right out there too. It'll hurt. The point of the hook is honed very sharp so it can go in a fish's mouth quickly. But if there's no barb, it'll come right out. 
you put a little antiseptic on it and a Band-Aid and you're off on your way. Um, that has happened maybe five times in my 25 plus years of coordinating this program. So maybe I overstated a little bit, but I just want folks to, obviously the, the, the word of the day is to be safe when you're out there with any pursuit, but fishing, that's probably the biggest worry is a swinging hook. So if you just control it, watch your back cast, watch your front cast, watch where it is at all times. And, and fishing is the original social distance activity. You should be six to eight, even 10 feet apart if you're out fishing, um, just to have a little space for the, the, the hooks to swing around and to have a little space when you're outside, which is nice. Uh, when you're experiencing the outdoors, you don't wanna be right jammed up with people. So that's really the only worry and the, the other little worry I'll show you after, but there really isn't too much. You can be pretty safe when you're out fishing in general, but the hook is the thing. So I'd recommend just clipping the barb off, um, especially if you're new. The other thing to put on, really the only other thing you need to put on is a float. A bobber, they also call them. They're strike indicators. So they uh, they help you know if a fish is biting. So if if your line is bouncing up and down, if the bobber's bouncing up and down in the water, which is just a little round ball attached a couple feet above your hook on the line, I'll show you it in a minute. That means a fish is biting and is tasting your bait and or has convinced that, that, they're, that the bait is good to eat and is gonna go. Then you just start slowly reeling and, and set that hook and bring the, bring the fish in. So it's a really neat tool for beginners. If you don't have that on the line, you have to really watch your line closely to see if it moves or the tip of your rod. So it's a neat little tool. Other than that, you don't need much else. You can put some weights on if you're fishing the bottom, or if there's a big wind in your face, you can put a little weight right underneath the bobber. You'll see some of these bobbers even have weights already on them because it's what the weight of what's on the line, your hook, your bobber, and your bait, and a little of your ability that gets that line shooting out into the water. So you need a little bit of weight. And if you have a steady wind in your face, you need a little more weight to get it out there. Swivels really only are important if you're um, using lures and lures that really twist, they keep the twist out of your line and they allow you to change lures quickly. And there's a neat little paradox in terms of hooks. I don't know why they ever came up with this, but the, the larger the hook, the smaller the number and the smaller the hook, the larger the number, as you can see here. So this is kind of a real representation of just your standard J hook. But as you get smaller, the number gets bigger. And then as you get bigger, the number gets smaller all the way down to one and then zero and below zero, they call aught. So two aught, three aught, four aught. So it's a weird, so the standard hook for beginners is, is a number six, eight, or a 10 um, J hook. I recommend, like I say, the circle hooks are, are better. You'll catch more fish, better for you, better for the fish. But numbers, just remember number six or eight, those are good for starters. So that's really all you need. You, you get your gear, and then I would recommend practicing at home before you go out, especially the young ones. Put a bucket or a hula hoop in the backyard. Uh, put a clothespin or just the bobber, or you can buy these little casting plugs in the shapes of fish um, that you can cast out into the, into the yard and, and play a game so you know how to cast before you go to the water. Um, so learning to cast, this is we're going to focus on the two kind of rod and reels that I recommended, the push button and the spinning. Here I'm showing you the correct way and the incorrect way to hold it. And I'll show you it in the video too. So the correct way here is with the reel sitting on top of the rod. The incorrect way is underneath on this one where you, you're actually pushing it with your finger and not your thumb is what you wanna be pushing it with. Um, so so you, you can kind of see it here. I kind of put it up against my shirt a little bit. So you wanna hold it with the reel sitting on top of the rod and you wanna push your thumb on this button. If you have it upside down, you're doing everything backwards, including reeling it in backwards. You want it sitting up for the push button rod and reel. So the correct way is the one on the left. The one on the right is the spinning, which is the other kind of beginner combination. Again, let me kind of show it to you here. It's a little hard with my virtual mass wildlife background. That, that is held underneath the rod and you put your fingers between the posts here and, and, and cast it like that. It's just a little more to it. YouTube is your friend here, folks. There's so many videos on learning how to cast and we have a bunch on our website too. So again, we're gonna send you these resources after. Um, and, and some of these are gonna be your knots. Your fishing knots are hugely important. Once you learn how to cast and have the right equipment, you, have to, you should do more than just the granny knot or a couple of overhand knots. Um, shoelace knots don't really work too good. The fish will easily pull through that. 
So the three I recommend, very, very easy, are clinch knot, improved clinch knot, and palomar knots. They're all terminal ends, so you're tying the hook, something on the end of your line. And the clinch knot's so, so easy. Um, once you learn how to do it, you can tie it with your eyes closed or in your sleep. So very simple. There is hundreds of fishing knots. It's kind of scary. They're, they're inventing them all the time. And there's good uh, video resources out there on how to tie them. But these are the tried and true ones, tried and true ones that, that many people have been using for probably 100 years. Um, and I would start with these three. Little knot terminology, the tag end is the, 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 the terminal end that you're going to put through the eye of the hook. And the standing line is the, the line that goes back to your reel. When you're watching knot video tutorials, you're, they're always going to talk about tag end, standing line, or running line. So it's good to know that. But very basic. Practice a few before you go out. Practice your casting, and you'll be good to go. So using the right bait is important, too. Uh, especially if you're going to live bait fish, live bait beats all else. Don't let anyone else tell you any different. That, and it's it's what appeals to fish most. F fish eat all or most all of their uh, diet is something alive in the water. So whether it's a worm or aquatic insect or a frog or a small baby bird, depending on how big the fish is, it's alive, it's kicking, it's moving around. So if you use baits like that, whether it's worms, mealworms, smaller fish that fish also eat, um, you're going to catch more fish. However, if you can't stand the idea of putting something alive on your hook, I get it. I totally get it. Don't let it stop you from fishing. So small little dense food items like chicken, cheese, hot dogs, chicken cooked or uncooked work fairly well. They, they'll still catch fish. Um, but just keep in mind, they don't stay on the hook as well as live bait. So if you cast really hard, a lot of times it'll fly off. That's why the, the hot dog with a thick skin will hold on to your hook a little more or a dense, uh, like a cheese stick uh, sliced up and thrown on the hook. Piece of corn will stay on pretty good. So don't let, you know, live bait stop you from fishing. If you don't like to put it on, go with food items. Um, they even make engineered baits in little jars that you can use, like little marshmallows that you could put on or, or, or salmon eggs that you can put on. And of course there's lures. I just caution people against using lures initially because they catch more anglers, more people that want to fish than they catch fish. They're designed, tackle companies want to sell them to you. So that a lot of them aren't so tried and true and don't work as good as the others. So if you're, if, you're, if you're really interested in lure fishing, it's a great way to catch fish. Once you learn how, um, just Google like top 10 lures for bass or top 10 lures for trout. So have some idea before you go into that store and stare blankly at that huge lure board in front of you saying, oh, my God, that looks awesome, that looks awesome, that looks awesome. Well, they all look awesome to us, but we're not the fish eating them so or choosing to, to bite them. So research first what catches what, and then go buy those select few, because they're not cheap. They're 5 or $6 each generally. Um, so know before you go and, and, and you know, do a little research. And you, you can catch fish with lures. So no reason not to fish if you don't like to put live bait on. We'll get back to live bait for people that aren't worried about it. The three big ones are mealworms here, which are my personal favorites, earthworms, whether it's smaller garden worms or night crawlers, and of course, fish. And usually it's a golden shiner you get in a bait and tackle shop or you collect yourself in a pond or lake before you go out or river. Uh, and those are the big three. Um, like I say, my personal favorite is the mealworm. A um, little known fact about all worms in North America, they were not here until the Europeans brought them here. Um, so it's kind of a, an invasive species. The cat is out of the bag. I mean, they're pr pretty much prolific throughout the country, but there are some forest soils that still don't have them and operate like they've done for eons without them. And a lot of people just take their use live bait and throw them up in the woods and that can introduce something that wasn't there to there and the, the, the worms are actually slowly spreading into southern and central Canada now and again they weren't here people think oh they're so natural and so great for the soil well they are once they get in and they've been here for 100 years they're great in the compost pile and they're great in some of your gardens but they do do some damage to forest soils so that is why I prefer the old ubiquitous mealworm they call it a mealworm because a lot of times when you buy flour or cornmeal, it, the eggs were already in there. You didn't even see them. You didn't know they were in there. They're kind of smaller than a grain of flour. <clears throat> so if you leave the flour in there for two or three years in the cupboards, and then you open up and go, oh my goodness, <laughs> there's worms in there. Well, they're mealworms. And their natural habitat is under the leaf litter in the soil, in the forest. And they hatch out into these little nondescript uh, darkling beetles. Um, and they go through a, um, 
kind of a, a long um, larval stage. And that's that's the stage you use for fishing. And you can buy them at pet stores. You can buy them online, bait and tackle shops, even stores like Walmart and Bass Pro and in and, and those in the smaller bait and tackle shops carry them. And other larvae too, but the mealworm is the one I always go to. Easy to keep alive, keep them refrigerated. They'll last for months in this stage. They don't need much to eat. So that's my personal favorite. If you want to catch bigger fish and, and particularly largemouth bass and big trout, you graduate to that. As fish get bigger, they're looking for more energy, and it's all about energy and energy out for fish when they decide to bite something. They're looking for a bigger meal. They're looking for fish. So bigger fish will eat smaller fish. So you put a fish on the hook, let it go out under your bobber and hold on. A lot of times um, the smaller fish can't take that, 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 that um, golden shiner. So the bigger fish can and will come up and grab it. So don't always assume you can catch a lot of big fish with mealworms and, and, and uh, night crawlers and worms as well though. So simple live bait rig, I'll show it with a worm. Um, I, I put them on like this sew them on and break them off. If they're too big, if they look like this, the fish are gonna come up and grab this part and not get the hook and leave you what they call short striked. So they'll, they'll miss the hook and grab most of your bait and pull the worm off. So it's best to kind of sew them on like this or break them into pieces. But, but just to show you what it looks like, here's your rod laying on the shore, right, right on the end, right below um, the terminal eye of the, the rod is your bobber. And then if you want to put a weight on, put it right under the bobber. And then two or three feet of line will wind down to your hook, um, hopefully a circle hook, a barbless circle hook, and then you'll put your bait on here and have at it. And that's a wonderful way to catch fish. Next tip is to bring the right accessories, folks. You need to accessorize. Fishing is no different than other pastimes. You can go crazy, wild, and spend hundreds of dollars but there are some very basic ones you really need beyond the rod and reel and your bait. And the accessories that you should really have to focus on here are gonna be sun, uh, polarized sunglasses, and don't, none of these are expensive. The, these are cheap, usually you can get them for about 10 bucks. They protect your eyes from swinging hooks, number one, be safe, right? They protect your eyes from solar uh, glare off the water and direct solar glare, which can be damaging to your eyes. And they allow you to see in the water column and they, they cuts the glare down and you can see fish way better with a pair of polarized sunglasses. So everyone should have those if you're fishing, whether you're kiddos or adults. Um, a pair of clippers, whether toenail, fingernail clippers to clip your line if you're tying hooks on or changing your lures up. And of course, something, some way to get a hook out of a fish's mouth. A lot of times it's easy. It's right on the edge of their, their lip and you pull it off. But other times it's a little deeper down in their throat or near their esophagus. Uh, so you go in with a pair of um, needle nose pliers or forceps. And these can be cheapos. You get at the hardware store for a couple bucks or you can get the elaborate fancy dancy ones that cost like $10, but none of them are very expensive. I like the forceps because they're long and skinny and they have a locking mechanism allowing you to get a good grip. And these can be gotten in most, you know, Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, pharmacies, uh, they have them in certain aisles. PFDs, uh, life jackets, critical if you're fishing out of a watercraft, you should always have it on no matter what time of year. It is the law if you're fishing in a kayak or canoe from September 15th to May 15th, and that's because of hypothermia. Uh, the hypothermia thermia threat, if you fall in and you don't have a life jacket on, that cold water can get to you really quick and shut your body down and make it more difficult to get to shore. Whether you had the life jacket on, you're staying afloat, you can get to shore a lot quicker. People don't realize that. It's actually the law. But for common sense, at least be sitting on it in the summer, know how to swim. And if you don't know how to swim, you should have it on at all times in any watercraft. And of course, we all know sunscreen and, um, sun, and uh, insect repellent. Insect repellent, especially in the summer, dawn and dust, mosquitoes with Tripoli and West Nile being more and more prevalent, always a good idea to have on. Target the right fish, folks. And for you folks, if you're new or coming back to the sport, I'd say anything that bites. I kind of already made that point before. Panfish in particular are plentiful, easy to catch, less technique involved and available all summer long into the early fall. They're really active. They're reproducing. They're eating a lot. So they're fun to catch inshore this time of year. Popular sunfish are bluegill, calico bass or black crappie, pumpkin seed, Bigger cousins, the largemouth bass and the smallmouth bass are actually sunfish. Yes, related to these smaller ones, they're just bigger. They don't necessarily have to be big. Um, some of them are only five, six, seven inches long if they're a year or two old, all the way up to 25 inches long if they're 
10 plus years old and five or six or seven pounds. So they can get really big and they can be a blast to catch in the spring, summer, and fall. A few tips. I would always start in lakes and ponds. Rivers are wonderful, but they're inherently a little harder for beginners because of the moving water and because it's, there, there's a little, a little more difficult to find the fish. Fish hold better to habitat in the river, but where to find them in the river, people come up to the river and kind of scratch their head because it all looks the same, just water flowing by. So it's a little more hard where in a lake or pond, you can see the downed trees, you can see the aquatic vegetation. If you have a map, you can see the deeper water habitat, which always holds fish, uh, particularly in the warm summer months. So it's a little more intuitive in, in standing water environments, plus you're not worrying about water flowing and tangled lines as much. So I would recommend starting in still water environments, that's lakes, ponds, and reservoirs, and start in the summer months over the late fall or early spring when the water's super cold, the fish are gonna be less active. What to do after the catch? So always, always important to know um, how to handle safe handling of the fish, removing the hook, best practices for catch and release and catch and keep, folks. So a quick little external anatomy, fish are a lot like people. Yes, that's right. They are vertebrate animals, just like us. They're adapted to living in the water, which we aren't. We're adapted to living on the land, which they aren't, but we share so many similarities, including our five senses. So our five senses are the seeing sense, the smelling sense, the hearing sense, the tasting sense, and the touching sense or feeling. So they have those five senses and you can exploit them to your gain. They see really well, they smell really well, they hear really well in the water column. Sound travels, some say six times faster in the water. I'm not sure the exact number that science would put on it, but sound travels faster under the water so they can hear you really well and it gets to them quicker. So be wary of that particularly in areas that you don't fish a lot on streams and rivers. You should walk up a little quieter to the bank. Otherwise they feel and hear that footfall. They can hear you talking really well. They smell really well. They use their upper jaw. They have a little openings called nares. So a lot of times when you put that live bait or bait or food in the water, give them a little time to smell that, get it through the water column. They're smelling it, then they're coming and they're attracted to it. They see really well but they don't have eyelids like we do. They can't close their eyes and get out of the sun. So when it's really sunny, they're in shade lines. They're under some structure or deeper water or in the shade. Um, it gives them a little protection. Um, they all have fins. Those are the arms and legs of the fish. Some species have very sharp pointy fins like the smallmouth bass. Be aware of that when you're handling the fish. I'll talk about that in a minute. They all have gills, which allow the fish to breathe. Those are the fish's lungs. Fish breathe the same element, which is what, folks? We know it is oxygen, right? Oxygen, they take it out of the water. We take it out of the air. So never a good idea to put your hands up in a fish's gills. And a little tip, if you catch a fish, don't see the hook. It's down deep in its mouth. And you see a little blood trickling from this. These are the gill covers of the fish. You won't necessarily see the gills unless they flare open. The gills are kind of the pinkish red fleshy things that are under there. But if you see blood trickling down the side of the body, that means you hook the fish in the gills by accident, cut the line. Cut the line and let that fish go. Don't take your pliers and start doing surgery in that area because you'll do more damage than good. Most of the time that doesn't happen, but once in a while it does. So these are the very fragile mechanisms that allow the fish to breathe. So just be wary of that. Never stick your fingers up in a fish's gills uh, either because you can do damage or introduce infection off your fingers into the gills. Um, they have a sixth sense called the lateral line that we don't possess. They are really lucky. It allows them to feel vibrations within the water column. I always give this analogy of, of um, the modern classics, Finding Nemo and Finding Dory, of course. There is the part where the school of fish um, I'll make these crazy shapes, which is really cool, a little exaggerated, but pretty accurate. They stay in these schools making these shapes by way of this lateral line mechanism. So they feel the vibrations from the fish all around them. They're allowed, and that, which keeps them in that tight school. And then the bigger fish like Bruce would use that lateral line to pick off those smaller fish. They, he knows they use their sense of smell, but they also use that lateral line to pick up vibrations in the water column, sometimes from hundreds and hundreds of feet or even miles away um, that hones them into their, their dinner. And make no mistake, Bruce is looking for fish to eat. 
spoiler alert. Um, <clears throat> other than that, internally, they're very similar to us. They have a heart, liver, kidneys, um, stomach, intestines, all that good stuff. They have a swim bladder that allows them to be neutrally buoyant in the water column. Um, so if they're coming up in the water column, there's like a balloon that inflates inside their body. It allows them to be a little more buoyant. They go down deeper. Gas or air is exchanged out of that and allows them to sink a little bit better. So very cool critters. Do they feel pain, you ask? I know I always get that question. Absolutely, they do. Science has come right around to that. They're sentient beings capable of feeling pain. Whether it's on the same level as people, science may never know that, but they do have nerve endings extending to many parts of their body. So yes, they feel pain. So if you care about the fish, you catch and release, getting them back into the water quickly and unharmed is, is important. So this is a picture of me handling a fish uh, with spiny um, dorsal fins and pelvic and pectoral fins. You can see the little spines still sticking out of the, 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 the back fin here. Um, the anal fin, but they have spines here and they have spines on the dorsal fin as well. So if you just run your hands from the, the, from the head back, you'll lay these fins flat and they can't raise them up. So they can't get you. And then you can get the hook out. It, when you first take it out of the water, it's going to be swinging around like crazy um, and flaring up those fins to try and get you with their spines. But once you just let it settle down, then, then approach it from the face back um, they're, they're harmless and you can just remove the hook. Certain species of fish like the trout, like pickerel, um, do not have these spiny fins. So you, you handle them a little differently. Um, incidentally, trout don't like to be handled much at all on the scale of one to 10 in terms of toughness being 10 and one being kind of really wimpy and can't stand being handled. I'd say the trout are more on the one to two or three Whereas like bass and sunfish and especially catfish are more on the 10 side, they can handle, they can, they can take being handled a little more and they're a little tougher in terms of it. After the catch, is it safe to eat the fish? Here's the deal on that folks. So it's a yes and no. So it's a maybe, right? So fish are high in omega-3 fatty acids and could be and should be part of a healthy diet. However, and there's always a however, there is a statewide advisory for pregnant women, nursing mothers and children under the age of 12 to not eat freshwater wild fish except our stock trout, which we raise to, to adult size quickly over a year to a year and a half and put out at, in a, at a clean environment and put into the environment. So if you like to eat fish, trout are delicious and we put them out there for that express purpose to have fun and to take home and eat. If you're in that demographic and what that demographic, all of those, the nursing mothers, the pregnant women and the younger folks have in common is development, developing, whether it's fetus or a young person developing, you don't want to have a lot of mercury in your system because this could hinder your development. If you get old like me, making a meal out of a fish um, is, is, a, is a healthy thing to do. I would still caution people not to eat the ginormous ones because mercury is something that bioaccumulates into a, a fish's flesh. And that happens over time. So if you eat the younger fish that are just over legal size, so if we're talking about a largemouth bass, it'd be a 12 or 13 inch fish that's three or four years old, that's probably gonna be a lot better to eat when you're my age or someone out of that demographic, um, then it's gonna be to eat that 25 inch long, six pound uh, largemouth that's 15 years old. So just keep that in mind. For the ultimate on this, consult the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and their website, their sister agency, they have a fish advisory list right on their website. You can go to the website and just Google it and boom, it'll come up. And it's, there's a whole listing, water body by water body. There's other things besides mercury, but mercury is that statewide advisory. So last but not least, we want folks to be responsible and ethical when you're out fishing. Please, please, please start from a young age, respecting the outdoors. Always leave the area better than you found it. Don't leave your litter out there. Respect other people's privacy and space. Again, fishing is the original social distance activity. Spread out. Be, uh, be careful about other people's space. Always practice safe fishing. Watch your hooks swinging around. Possess a valid fishing license if you're 15 years of age and older, know and understand the regulations. Again, you can get them right on our website and we'll probably send you the link to that. Release fish immediately if you do not intend to eat and or have the fish preserved by a taxidermist. Do not release any unused bait fish in the water, a fish that you would buy from a bait and tackle shop or trap, let alone fact that you can buy a bait trap 
and you're allowed to use one per licensed angler or one per person to catch your own small fish to use. And you would just bait it with bread, dog food or cat food. They're little conical traps or even rectangle traps. Put it down in a pond or lake or, or a stream or rivers coming into a pond or lake. Check it every day and you can scoop out the, the most of the time it's golden shiners or other legal bait fish that's listed in our rules and regulations as well. But you can't take those fish and move them from one water body to the other. So just know that as well. And it's not a bad idea to report people that are breaking the law. Um, don't ever confront them, but if you can get some information and call the Massachusetts Environmental Police, if you see people filling the bucket with all kinds of fish and even you know, fish that have regulations on like trout and bass and no matter what size, they're just taking them all. Not a bad idea to let folks know that or they're trashing the place, leaving all kinds of litter. They pull up with their vehicle and dump. Not a bad idea to get a license plate and, and just call your local PD or environmental police. Um, but don't ever confront anyone that's doing such things. So with that, the worst kind of litter is absolutely fishing line, folks. Fishing line is a wonderful tool to get your bait in the water and to catch fish, but it's also plastic and it doesn't break down so easy and people tend to leave it in the environment, which is so sad. Two examples right here, this peregrine falcon, which is a uh, species in Massachusetts that's uh, not doing so good. It's either endangered, threatened, or special concern. I forget the exact designation at the moment, um, but there's limited numbers of them. So we're, we're, we're always watching them. And this happens to be a chick, the mother, thought that fishing line would be a great way to weave her nest, and it probably is. It's a great line that you could weave very easily. Uh, the mother found it on the ground, picked it up, put it in the nest, but the chick got caught up in it and tangled up and died, sadly. Um, this robin was having a great day. This was at Indian Lake in Worcester, flying along the shore looking for something to eat and got tangled up in fishing line and accidentally hung itself. One of our volunteers, volunteer instructors took this picture a few years ago. Fortunately, it didn't die in vain. I use it in all of my education programs to show what not to leave behind. So this is what you typically see. Big old ball of fishing line that people leave behind. I don't, for the life of me, know why you would do that. Um, except that maybe it's an innocent thing. You're so anxious to get back in fish and you clipped your line and then you started fishing again and you forgot it. Didn't put it in your pocket correctly or your tackle box. But please don't do that. Take the fishing line out with you. So with that, I'll say have fun, keep going and keep learning in your fishing journey. Um, hopefully it is just the beginning for you and it gets you outside and no healthier way to be than outside doing something. And fishing is just a wonderful activity to do. So thank you all. And if there's any questions, comments or concerns, I'm here for you. Um, have you ever heard of an alligator gar? Because I've never heard of it. I an alligator garfish? Absolutely. Yeah, I've never Absolutely. heard of that. They're a huge fish that live in the Mississippi drainage, and alligator gars. You bet. We don't have them here in New England, and hopefully we never will, because that would be one big, huge predator that we'd have to contend with. But if you want to catch alligator gar, you can go out in the certain states out along the Mississippi River and catch them. Yes. Good question, Gus. We have big fish too, though. We have pickerel and pike, which can be three and even four feet long, which could look a lot like an alligator gar, but, but are not, but are also very big species and are fun to catch. I have a question for you, Jim. And sure, Laura. It's not really fishing. It is and it isn't. It's about, um, I mentioned in the beginning, I'm from the West Coast. And so, of course, we have those big salmon and they do the massive migration all around. Yep. So we have lots of locks, which yes. is where um, you lock part of it down and it fills with water and it lets the fish go through. And so it's kind of like an elevator, a water yep. elevator for fish. Yep. Um, and I was out walking, hiking just around Lake Cotituate, right around here in Framingham. And my mm -hmm. husband and I stumbled across these massive fish that my sister said they were probably carp. They were at least three feet long. You got it. They were carp. <laughs> they were huge. <laughs> and we were like, look at all the fish. And it was in um, the Cotituit Dam part. Yeah. And they were jumping up. And I didn't know, are there locks around? Is that What does fish migration look like around here? Well, fish migration here is really salmon. And the salmon, are, we, we came into uh, uh, our own as an agency on the backs of salmon and trying to protect them, Atlantic salmon. They were decimated here in New England. And we kind of sadly gave up on them um, because the returns just weren't there. So after over 100 years of trying to bring them back, we, we walked away. But th that was the big migrating fish. But there are migrations of, of striped bass and, and um, shad 
and other saltwater fish, that even, even freshwater fish that live in saltwater during certain times like the American eel. So there is migrations. Those fish though are, are, are um, common carp. We don't have Asian carp yet, and hopefully we never will. Asian carp are the ones you see jumping like crazy in the Midwest, in the Mississippi drainage, responding to boats going by, they'll jump, and even anglers have been hit in the head um, by these huge fish. But the ones you saw, Laura, are probably just common carp. Introduction from, I, I believe, Great Britain, England, Europe, ultimately many, many 100, 150 years ago, but they've they've naturalized and they they grow wild in certain uh, water bodies and, and Lake Kachichwit certainly has them. And the telltale on them is you'll see big schools. You'll see three, four, five, 10, 15 all come swimming in and they're like huge, you know, 25, 30, 35 inches long, 15, 20 pounds. And they root around on the bottom. Their mouths are pointed to the bottom and they'll just kind of root around as they're moving and they constantly move throughout the water body. So they'll be here, and then 10 minutes later, they'll be a quarter mile away down the water body, and they're hard to catch. People that target them will chum, and chumming is a practice where you just put food into the water a day or two ahead of time. Like you put a can of corn or some dog food, and you'll, and you'll see the water and get the fish to come and expect food to be there and then go fishing for them. But those were absolutely common carp. Fabulous. Thank you. And we have a question from Nicole. All right, Nicole. Hi. So I just started fishing this year, and... Um... So I catch a lot of bluegill, which is great, but I'm like terrified of catching a chain pickerel or a pike. And I'm just wondering if you could share a few words of wisdom about what to do in terms of getting the hook out of the mouth without getting uh, mangled. Yes, yes. Those are, those are the ones that all fish, by the way, I should have talked about this in my quick little anatomy spiel, but I happened to look at my, my time and I was kind of ticking away. So I, I just speed up. Um, so all fish have teeth. Um, some fish have more developed teeth than others, and the, the, the sausage, which are pike pickerel and muscalunge, have very developed teeth. <laughs> so they have very sharp, um, fairly long, you know, up to maybe a quarter inch long teeth. So they can be intimidating. They're not going to try and bite you. They're just, what they're doing when you get them out of the water, they're just, they're just trying to gulp. They're trying to breathe. So their mouths are going to be up and down. But what they generally do, if it's a bigger one, you can slip your hand up under the gill plate, that under the, the operculum, which is the gill cover, hold it, grip it good there, and then take, I don't have one to show you, but then take the hook out with your pliers or even your hand if it's on the edge of the mouth. Don't ever like lip them. You could take your fingers and put it right in a bass's, even a huge bass mouth. They have very fine teeth, like a nail file, so really easy to deal with. But yeah, the pike and pickerel, don't be terrified. You can also grip them by the body. If they're only 15 to 20 inches long, they don't have spines on their fins. So you can wet your hand first so you don't remove a lot of the mucus coating, then just grab them firmly along the middle of the body and take the hook out. They get really huge. Like if you caught a big pike that was 35 or 40 inches long, you're going to want to employ that technique where you, you literally take your fist in your hand and put it up under the gills without touching the gills. They have a huge, heavy gill cover just to hold them there without, you don't even have to pick them up. You can just hold them in the water there and remove. You can YouTube it. There's a lot of videos of people handling pike, pickerel and muscalunge and showing you how to remove the hook. Yeah, I did YouTube it and I did see that putting your fingers under the gill, that looks a it, little scary too. I know it's scary, but there's no <laughs> teeth there. And if you slide it tight to that operculum cover, or gill cover, you don't touch the gills. You're just gripping that really good. And then you put your fist around it and remove the hook. They'll settle right down. And a little trick to calming fish down of all species is to flip them over. If you flip them on their back, expose their belly, they get disoriented and they will calm down. Okay. You may have already answered this. Does the blue-green algae, which is bad for people, does that affect the fish? That's a wonderful question. Cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, and there's many species of it. And I think the short answer is we don't really know yet. It's a relatively new phenomenon. It might be a product of global warming. We're seeing it in a lot more water bodies now. And certainly it affects humans and or their pets that use the water body. You don't want to ingest it. Um, and that's the hazard. That's why when there's a, a you know, cyanobacteria outbreak, a blue-green algae outbreak, they don't allow people to swim in certain water bodies. However, fish are naturalized in these water bodies and make their living by breathing water in and out and have, and there's always been certain levels of bacteria in water bodies. So I'm not sure that they're, we're trying to figure it out. It's all happening so fast. There's probably some studies that would, that would give you a little more definitive on that, but our, our, our aquatic biologists and our fishery section are, 
are working on that and in, in, in trying to figure out what we should let folks know about it. There, there's a series that we're doing with um, the Worcester Department of Public Works and Parks called the Blue um, Angler Series. And, and if you go to that, just Google that or just Google Worcester Department of Public Works and Parks, you can find it. And they just did a cyanobacteria one hour presentation with one of our biologists and the DCR biologist that's dealing with that. So there'd be a little more insight for you there. But yeah, it's it's something that annoys me because we go camping. We used to camp a lot up when, when my kids were younger at Tully Lake in Royalston. I'm kind of from the central part of the state. Wonderful water body. And they closed it year after year. They You could camp there, but you couldn't go in the water. So kind of what's the point, right? You're in the summer. You want to be fishing and swimming. So that was getting frustrating. And I think certain years, this year, I don't think it's as big deal because there's a lot more um, – movement because of the high water flows and there's a lot more turnover within that system and a lot of systems but years when it's really hot not much rain that seems to be when it really jumps up great question though thank you you're welcome so i i also had a question um do do people normally bring the rules and regulations with them um fish identifications with them so that when they they catch something i mean I, I would have no idea what i can keep what i can't keep off the top of my head um how, how do people bring yeah. that with them when they go fishing absolutely you can you can print out our guide if you want you can get our guide by coming to our office or or any of our vendors like walmart will give you the the, the fishing guide and it shows you all the different fish but we also have a wonderful publication um, called the fish of Massachusetts kind of opens into a big poster of all the fish. And, and if you just email me, I'll send one to you, or you can email the Westboro office. We have a general email, uh, mass wildlife email, and they'll send one to you. For, it's free. We give it out at all of our in-person um, fishing presentations, but yeah. And, and there's apps now. I, I I'm so delinquent with, with technology because I'm an older fella. Uh, but there's there's fish brain there's a there's an app called Fish Brain that's really good. There's other apps, Fish ID apps that you can literally take a picture of the fish and it'll tell you what it is. Just like there's there's ones for plants now too. Um, so they're pretty amazing. Not hard to find um, that that quick answer. And that's a great question. You catch this fish, you don't even know what it is. Especially if you want to eat fish, and you got to find out first what it is, and then if it's if it's legal to keep and eat. Um, yeah, it's good to have at least our fish and wildlife laws loaded up on your device. The, there's only a few pages of them and or a hard copy with you and you fish, but wonderful question. I've got a quick question. Uh, thanks for the great presentation, Jim. Um, oh, you're welcome, Marissa. If you find eel, where would I go in Massachusetts? <laughs> the elusive eel. Well, they're more nocturnal, so you're going to see them more at night. Um, most small water bodies are going to have them. We're a little concerned about eels these days. Their breeding grounds, the Sargasso Sea, kind of central Atlantic where the European eels and the um, North American eels congregate, mate. <laughs> they don't mate together, which is unbelievable. They, they, they mate within their own species, even though they look a lot alike. And then they go back and, and live out. The, the little elvers, the little small ones go back and and that whole cycle starts again in freshwater systems. So they're kind of the opposite of salmon that go into saltwater. They live a lot of their life in saltwater and come into freshwater to spawn. They live most of their life in freshwater and go to the saltwater to spawn. But th that sea and a lot of our oceans are very polluted and we're worried about them. But their numbers are still decent in most of our inland waters. And they're in most of the waters. You just don't realize they're there. But they're a very nocturnal fish. So like with catfish, you know, the all the different species of catfish and eels, you can catch them more bottom fishing with bait at night. Uh, but you can catch them in the day if you're bottom fishing. Small ponds, lakes throughout the state. And if you catch one, you'll know exactly what it is right away. It looks like a ginormous snake on the end of your line. And, it's, and it can be very difficult to remove because they're very slimy and they have a very thick mucus coating and they move a lot. Um, but they're also used for bait for saltwater fishing. And they're raised for that too in, in certain farming environment. So great question though, Marissa.